Good afternoon, folks, and thank you very much for joining us. There's still a number of people joining us as I start to speak, um, so I'll just run through some uh, basic things to start with. Um, I am Alan Barr, I'm the head of personal tax planning here at Brodie's, and welcome to our Scottish budget webinar uh, analyzing uh, bits of what happened yesterday and um, for uh, tax nerds like me uh, budget day is a bit like christmas day so this is budget boxing day and i get to play with all my tax toys today uh, so this is the the tax toy uh, that, that i'm enjoying playing with most at the moment um, i have with me at least in the ether uh, neil ritchie our director of personal tax at Brody's. Isabel D'Inverno, uh, our Director of Corporate Tax uh, here at Brodie's, and we're especially delighted uh, to welcome uh, Stuart Patrick, uh, CBE, Chief Executive of Glasgow Chamber of Commerce. Uh, what we are going to do over the course of the next uh, short hour is to have a look at the most important tax effects of the Scottish budget, uh, and, but also, particularly from Stuart uh, in our final session, at some of the other measures announced uh, which involve spending some of that tax. Um, a little bit of background, uh, Scottish tax devolution has had its own evolution. And as part of that evolution, the Scottish budget has got to be much, much more important uh, than it used to be. And it, it is now, arguably at least, at least as important as its UK equivalent. Um, its UK equivalent, of course, hasn't happened yet. Uh, it is scheduled for the 8th of March, and indeed there has not been a, a full tax raising um, Scottish budget now for, for a good year, delayed by elections, Brexit, pandemic, all kinds of things have delayed it. But this um, situation of a Scottish budget being before its Westminster equivalent creates undoubted difficulties for the Scottish Government in what they propose, because by definition they, they cannot know the full state of finances that they will have available, um, and they cannot know what the tax rates and indeed reliefs and possibly new taxes, that other changes that could be brought in on the UK budget on the 8th of March. And these changes have a, a potential direct effect on the spending available to the Scottish Government. But nonetheless, they have to hold their budget at around this time to make sure that particularly in relation to income tax, but for other things as well, that there is enough time to get the Scottish rates of tax into place before the start of the financial year. The Scottish um, parliamentary system is somewhat different um, and it is absolutely necessary for the Scottish budget, at least to have the proposals, come forward this early in that particular cycle. Um, so there could conceivably be changes after the UK budget has taken place, but this budget held yesterday will be undoubtedly the framework that the Scottish government wishes to pursue for the next tax year. And just drawing a bit further on its growing importance, of course, one of the things that it does, our first main topic, is that it sets the income tax rates uh, and thresholds, more importantly, for all Scottish taxpayers. So uh, for the vast majority of Scottish citizens are also Scottish taxpayers, and it, therefore that change, if there is a change, will have a direct effect on them. Um, and there are comparators to be done, with previous years and fairly obviously with the rest of the UK. And that second comparator can't really be done until the UK budget has taken place. And these um, income tax rates, of course, affect not only individuals as such, but in their businesses, uh, in their non-corporate form as sole traders or as partnerships, uh, then the Scottish income tax rates will be vital as well as in relation to Scottish property income. Um, in relation, of course, to corporation tax, any potential changes in that have to await the Westminster budget. Equally, the uh, main fully devolved tax, land and buildings transaction tax, uh, affects all land in Scotland. So, uh, particularly with the devolution of income tax, but with other things as well, the importance of the Scottish budget as a tax event has grown. Uh, it, it probably, frankly, in that, 
does not get the, the kind of uh, public respect it deserves for the vital effect it has on Scotland's citizenry. Having said that, um, and again, typically of the last few Scottish budgets, all Scottish budgets in the past, in many ways, it's also a, a spending um, event. Uh, and the document is uh, very much a spending document. Proportionately, the amount of space devoted to spending decisions far outweighs that to raising the tax to pay for some of these spending decisions. Um, and uh, that is particularly the case at the moment where spending uh, is so important in the pandemic. Uh, business uh, in particular is relying on some of these spending decisions quite as much, uh, if not more, uh, than the, some of the tax decisions that are made. And we'll approach uh, some of these at the end. Um, but uh, we will start at the, that prime tax for all of us, uh, and that is income tax. And at this point, I'll hand you over to Neil Ritchie. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, given the, the, the chaos uh, that COVID has caused, um, it's perhaps unsurprising that there have been uh, limited changes to the income tax, Scottish income tax rates. So um, with that, it, we were delighted. We were able to achieve three headlines uh, yesterday. Um, Firstly, uh, Scottish income tax remain unchanged. Um, the second being that Scottish tax bans uh, are, are increased in line with CPI, other, other than the, the top band which, uh, of 150,000, which remain uh, static, uh, as, as it has done for many years now. The, the, the third uh, headline from yesterday was that uh, the, the plans to implement a, an effective Scottish uh, personal allowance have been shelved uh, while the, the because the, the Parliament sorry the, the plans to introduce a new uh, Scottish personal allowance uh, in the, the time of in the period of this Parliament have been have been shelved basically so that the Scottish government can um, spend the money in more di directly on, on uh, events. And frankly, as a, a, a Scottish tax uh, advisor, uh, I, I'm quite delighted because uh, with having five rates of tax to, to look at, plus the English uh, or the rest of the UK tax rates on top of that, uh, a further um, Scottish personal allowance would certainly have added quite a great deal of, of, of difficulty. Anyway, trying to uh, add some, some figures to that uh, th these headlines, um, here we have uh, exactly that. So you, the five, the five bands remain. So we still have the personal allowance, obviously. The starting band remains: basic rate, uh, intermediate rate, the higher rate, and advanced. Uh, and and the rates uh, are zero percent, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, forty-one, and forty-six, all as before. So the the the, the real changes are the the CPI changes. So the personal allowance is moving up all by half a percent. So 12,500 uh, has become 12,570, the starting band uh, up to 14,667 uh, and, and, and so on. So just, just pushing these up slightly. Um, but but the, as I said, the, the 150,000 band uh, remains uh, static. Um, so, so um, the top rate taxpayers are still paying the, the, the same amount. But what exactly, uh, drilling into these numbers, what exactly does that mean? Well, the, shall we say the pivot point, which we're always interested in, um, is, is 27,393 pounds. Um, those on incomes beneath that, uh, you're better off if you're a Scottish taxpayer, um, but if, uh, for all incomes in excess of 27,393, um, Scottish taxpayers pay more. Now, they don't pay a lot more um, uh, up to 43,662 is when we, 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 we become higher rate uh, payers in Scotland, taxpayers in Scotland. And, and as you'll see, there is, there is minimal difference between 
uh, a Scottish taxpayer at 43,662 compared to the rest of the UK. The real difference though is that after that point, um, we jump up to 41% whilst the rest of the UK remains at 20%. Uh, and, and the rest of the UK don't become higher taxpayers until 50,260. So by that stage, the difference has suddenly jumped up uh, to one and a half uh, thousand and it represents a significant difference um, as part of your, 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 your income at 3.08. As we then progress up to 100,000, um, you know, you, you'll see the, there's 2,046 pounds more money, uh, tax is, is paid by a Scottish taxpayer. But because the, the, the real gap between 43 and 50 is, is, is the horrible one, you'll see that the, the percentage of income has, has dropped off over that period. But then when you hit 100,000, um, between 100 and 125,000, the, the personal allowance is, is withdrawn. So that means there's an effective rate of tax in that period, uh, in, that, in that section of 60% of in the rest of the UK, but that's 61.5% as an effective rate not an actual rate, but an effective rate. Um, so all of a sudden, once again, Scotland sees a slight jump and it jumps up at this point to 2.69. At the top rate, 150,000, that is where the greatest difference is, is, is noticed um, of 3.24%. And that, by then your taxpayers uh, a Scottish taxpayer is paying £4,854 more than uh, their uh, rest of UK um, equivalents. And just to show you that at, at 200000 again, there's quite a significant difference, but it's starting uh, to all flatten out uh, again. Uh, it's just 2.68% of the income. Um, is what's happening here. And that's really because the, the, the big chunk uh, between 43 and 50 and 100 and 125 are now suddenly becoming smaller percentages uh, of, of, of uh, uh, that person's income. Um, so it, it all starts to, to roll down. So what are the conclusions we take from all of this? Well, if for lower rate, uh, for, for lower income uh, taxpayers, um, Scotland is, is, is a good place to be. For uh, at top rate taxpayers, it's, it's, it's not a great place to be, but, it, but it's not so bad. I would say though, for the, 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 the higher rate taxpayers from 43 up to 150,000, that is where the biggest uh, punch is felt um, in, in these bands. And I'm afraid um, that is about as much as I can um, make excitement out of yesterday's announcements. So uh, with that, I shall uh, hand you over to Isabel uh, to discuss LBTT. Thank you. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, I'm Isabel de Merno and I'm going to speak about LBTT or the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax. This is the tax that you pay when you buy a house or take a lease of commercial premises. Um, and uh, obviously a lot of people still refer to it as stamp duty. Um, but LBTT is slightly different from the income tax, um, which Neil was talking about, because LBTT is a fully devolved tax. What does that mean? It means that the Scottish Government has control over the rates of the tax, but also over all of the legislation as well. So everything to do with LBTT is done in Scotland. And in fact, it's collected by Revenue Scotland, our own tax authority. And that's different from the position with income tax, where um, the Scottish Government sets the rates and the bans but the tax is actually, actually collected by uh, HMRC and the legislation is passed in Westminster. So um, LBTT, what changed in the Scottish budget? Well, not a lot really. Um, none of the rates of LBTT changed and there was uh, 
perhaps the most um, interesting thing that people were waiting to hear about was a COVID related measure which was introduced last year, which was a temporary increase to the residential nil rate ban. So last year from the 15th of July 2020, um, the residential nil rate band was increased from 145 to 250, which makes quite a difference um, for people buying houses. Um, this was always said to be a temporary measure um, and that it would finish on the 31st of March 2021. But some people were hoping that the LBTT holiday would be increased. Um, that did not happen, however and it's going to finish on the 31st of March 2021 as planned um, and it's worth bearing in mind that if you want to take advantage of the uh, uh, increased nil rate band you have to actually complete the purchase of your house uh, before the 31st of March. There has been some coverage in the press about ways of possibly locking it in uh, without actually completing but that only applies to uh, properties in England and Northern Ireland. It doesn't apply in Scotland. So completion is the name of the game here. Um, and you have to complete before the 31st of March. So um, why was the nil rate band not extended? Uh, or the, why was the increase in the nil rate band not extended? Well, as we can see on the next slide, the take from LBTT, i.e. how much LBTT was paid by Taxpayers to Revenue Scotland in December 2020 was a record 82 million and that was largely from residential purchases and that compared with 62 or so in the previous month and 60, 61.5 in December 2019. So um, the Finance Secretary Kate Forbes pointed out that the property market is now probably functioning um, more or less as normal, although I, I guess some would take um, exception to that description of it, but certainly the, the receipts um, support the fact that perhaps a, an extension to this nil rate band wasn't needed. So just looking at the uh, position from uh, 1st of April, the nil rate band is 145 and uh, the other, there's a 2% rate comes back and so on. So there's an increased um, LBTT charge if you buy a house after the 1st of April or you, if you complete the purchase of a house after 1st of April. Um, there is first time buyer's relief, um, which is still available. Um, it increases the nil rate band to 175,000 for people who qualify but that actually only gives you an LBTT saving of £600 and there's quite a lot of conditions that have to be met. So, um, not much to report on LBTT itself, no change to the rates and no extension to the holiday. And um, that echoes the approach that's been taken by the Welsh Government, who also didn't extend their um, Welsh equivalent ho uh, holiday. So um, perhaps not surprising, although it will be disappointing for some. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Alan Barr, who's going to talk about the additional dwelling supplement. Um, additional dwelling supplement, if LBTT is the bread and butter of fully devolved Scottish taxis, it's the one that is collect collected and run completely from Scotland, um, additional dwelling supplement is the jam. Um, it is uh, an additional 4% on residential property purchases when the purchaser or lots of people close to the purchaser, husband, wife, civil partners, young children, the dog, that kind of thing, owns another dwelling at that point. If they own another dwelling, then there's an additional 4% and this additional dwelling supplement at 4% can often exceed the basic LBTT. Um, that, uh, effect has shown that, that probably about 20%, a fifth of Scottish um, residential purchases involve 
additional dwelling supplement. A good few more will involve consideration of it before deciding it doesn't apply. Um, and the amount of money raised is higher than that one fifth. So it's a really important element of the system. And it doesn't apply if you are replacing your main residence. The obvious way of that is that you sell your main residence before or at the same day as you buy your new one. That that ideal situation, of course, doesn't happen every time. Um, if you buy before you sell, then what you have to do is pay this extra 4% on your purchase and then make a repayment claim for it. And the time to, that you're given to sell your, your previous main residence or otherwise dispose of it, it doesn't need to be a sale, is fixed in the law at 18 months in Scotland. It's equivalent in uh, stamp duty land tax in uh, uh, England and stamp tax in Wales is 36 months. Um, and there was an extension, a brief extension to 36 months if you had a purchase in a very restricted period between 24th September 18 and 24th March 2020. But you will notice that period has gone. So if you buy a new dwelling house now and pay uh, additional dwelling supplement, you only have you only have the 18 months that has been restored, as it were, and there was no need to make an announcement about it in the budget yesterday. There wasn't one. The only possible one could have been an extension of it. But for the reasons Isabel gave, they, they weren't going to do that. So that is in force now. And you have the rather odd situation that people who bought a long time ago still have a longer period to dispose of their previous main residence than people buying now have starting, as it were, today uh, or any date since 25th March 2020. Um, one other point about uh, in this kind of area is other UK uh, changes. Uh, there is to be a 2% SDLT surcharge for non-residents, that is non-UK residents, buying uh, residential property in uh, England, Wales and Northern Ireland, in, uh, sorry, England and Northern Ireland only at the moment. Uh, the, the point about this is uh, that this will not apply in Scotland and in a sense Scotland got in first by increasing their additional dwelling supplement um, from uh, what was 3% to 4%. Um, so this change will not, it seems, come in Scotland. It also uh, takes away from the Scottish Government the kind of awkward um, uh, thing that they might need to decide about who it should apply to. It applies to non-UK residents in the rest of the UK, but would they, for example, try and apply it to non-Scottish residents if they had such an equivalent in Scotland? Well, it hasn't happened and uh, it doesn't seem very likely to happen. Um, there's talk in the south of uh, SDLT and council tax being replaced by an annual property tax. Uh, that too seems unlikely to happen uh, uh, in Scotland. There are some Scottish advantages uh, in LBTT, uh, notably in buying multiple properties, very important advantages, um, and the system con continues to evolve. And what is happening, and the illustrations today uh, are very much of that, is that the two systems, the, the stamp duty as people refer to it, on both sides of the border, the two systems are diverging and continue to diverge. Nothing said yesterday changes that, the divergences are still there, and if anything, the Scottish ones have probably been re reinforced by the basic no change to uh, most of LBTT yesterday. Uh, so at that point, I, I'm delighted to pass you over to Stuart Patrick, um, who will um, uh, talk uh, about a number of things, uh, but starting in the tax world, that very important tax for businesses in particular, uh, non-domestic rates will form part of what he has to say. Over to Stuart. Hello, thanks uh, Alan. I'm hoping you can uh, see me. Uh, forgive me if I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the response to the crisis uh, in looking at the budget. And perhaps in contrast to what Alan was saying, I think we have to regard the Scottish budget as more the trailer to the UK's budget uh, as the main event. So, because so much hinges on what the UK budget says in March uh, uh, as regards the, the kind of support that businesses are going to see as they go into 21 22. I went into the budget with some messages ringing uh, firmly in my ears from uh, chamber members. 
uh, very first one was um, this plea for a roadmap that combines vaccination strategy with a reopening plan and the corresponding business support to go alongside that. And perhaps not surprisingly, given all that we've heard from the First Minister uh, and other, uh, other advisors on the medical side, we haven't really gleaned very much from the Scottish Budget about what a roadmap will look like. The second issue that I was asked to uh, uh, chivy for uh, in conversations with Kate Forbes and others was rates relief for 21-22. And on that score, we got some good news. We got um, three months rates relief for those businesses in retail, hospitality, leisure and aviation who have been so badly affected by the crisis. Uh, more often than not, closed businesses. Um, it's actually worth noting that the Scottish Government in that regard helped the aviation industry first, but I'll come back to uh, the, uh, uh, the consequences of the uh, pandemic on the aviation industry later. They certainly, the Scottish Government moved in on rates relief before the UK Government did. Um, and Fraser Valander described that decision by Kate, Forwards, uh, Kate Forbes as a, uh, on rates relief uh, for uh, that three months as a surprise uh, that she's taken a uh, uh, decision to go for it, even before uh, Rishi Sunak has made his decisions clear in March in the full budget. Um, the principle that we are holding to as a chamber is that we want to see full rates relief for all businesses that are closed for as long as they are closed, but we are also looking for relief during the reopening phase as demand rebuilds for those businesses. For those that are not benefiting from rates relief uh, in those categories, I suppose the other bit of good news was that rates poundage actually reduced in the budget from 49.8 uh, pence in the pound to 49 pence in the pound, which is going in the right direction. The second uh, ask on, uh, on uh, business support was around job retention scheme, which is of course Chancellor of the Exchequer's decision. Uh, I noted that uh, Kate Forbes said uh, that she rather wished that, that the Chancellor was going to sustain job retention scheme before it's due uh, date or end date in, in April um, and we support that view because we are very desperate to avoid cliff edge uh, unemployment as a consequence of closure of job retention scheme. The third point um, I would make is uh, the Kate Forbes' announcements around sustained and appropriate business support to damaged uh, sectors and also for that matter filling gaps for those who have never received support uh, throughout the 10 uh, months of the crisis. Um, and the one thing that Kate Forbes did say was that the Scottish Government will commit to supporting the Strategic Framework uh, Business Fund, uh, but again it depends entirely on the UK Government's decisions uh, as to what that will look like and of course that's the fund which will pay the kind of two thousand three thousand pounds a month that goes to businesses uh, in the likes of retail hospitality accommodation and so forth we also saw from uh from kate forbes that the uh commitment that there would be a february additional february payment uh in line with what has been done in january um that isn't so much in next year's budget obviously that's coming out of COVID payments uh, this year but I guess there's a flatness uh, that we detect in, in those uh, industries in retail, hospitality, tourism, et cetera, because there's no doubt that the Strategic Framework Business Fund grants aren't really covering the costs that those businesses are having to, uh, to incur whilst being closed and uh, they're running down reserves or building up debts that are currently un otherwise unfunded. There was also no direct response from uh, the Cabinet Secretary on gap filling. So, for example, uh, companies where the directors uh, are paying themselves predominantly by dividends and, and have very low salaries. But we did see a doubling of an extra 60 million going into local authorities for discretionary funding. And so there is an opportunity to uh, lobby the local authorities to use that discretionary funding to help to fill those gaps uh, that have persisted throughout. The next message I was getting from the members was uh, key asset support, um, asking to what extent was uh, budgetary power being used to ensure that some of the most important assets for economic recovery were going to come out of the crisis in a reasonable shape. The airports stand out uh, as one example, but also for that, for that matter, convention centres um, and in my particular bias, uh, city centres, but I'm sure for those with a rural bent, uh, equally to what extent 
rural communities were being supported who depended on particular businesses in the tourism industry. As we said, there was nothing additional on airports. Uh, and I know that the private sector airports in particular in Scotland are feeling particularly uh, uncomfortable about the level of support that they are getting from both Scottish and UK governments. Uh, and we are going to continue to argue for, uh, for example, uh, reviews of air passenger duty and uh, air departure tax in the, at the point when airports are reopening. There was also not a terrible amount on city centres in contrast to some quite specific um, announcements around rural areas. Um, we are paying particular attention to the damage being done to Edinburgh, Glasgow and Aberdeen city centres which are all very badly affected um, in uh, businesses that depend on heavy footfall that uh, are obviously closed just now and therefore uh, uh, that isn't an impact on them. But as soon as the economies reopen, footfall uh, did not recover in city centres at the pace that we would have liked to see. Uh, and yet those businesses and those city centres are the ones paying disproportionately high uh, rates because of the rateable values that they incur or have. So although we saw rates poundage dropping, as I said, from 49.8 to 49 pence for the pound, some of those businesses in the city centre are now arguing quite vigorously that the uh, rates system is a broken system, that the shift to online retailing, the shift to home working, um, and to a certain extent even uh, the shift to uh, home dining uh, has meant that uh, there are businesses like Amazon and the supermarkets that are getting a disproportionate benefit uh, as a consequence of the rating system. Now, I know that I don't entirely agree with the argument of the supermarkets, but it's very hard to argue uh, about the, uh, the, the benefit that an Amazon is, is getting from the current rate system. There are also a couple of interesting, although they're specifically aimed at city centres, there's a couple of interesting decisions and nods, I think, towards the repurposing of assets in um, towns and city centres, or at least I think it'll be towns and city centres that will benefit mostly from that. A business growth accelerator, where the, uh, that scheme uh, is expanded from just new builds to property improvements. And uh, for new builds, you get your 12 months uh, holiday on rates payments uh, as you are letting the new build. Uh, for the uh, property improvement for a change of use, you get no increase in non-domestic rates because of the change in use for 12 months, so you could argue it's comparatively marginal, but equally um, you're seeing some change to the fresh start uh, relief uh, for pr pr premises that are have been uh, out of use for uh, six months or more, uh, where the threshold uh, has gone up from 65,000 rates per value to 95,000 rates per value. So a bit of a bit more being done to help encourage the repurposing of assets. But our view is that it's still we're relatively tinkering around the edges and we're arguing for the Chancellor to look at uh, reintroducing uh, business premises renovation allowance, which ran from 2007 to 2017 in designated zones um, to encourage um, the reuse of uh, redundant uh, properties uh, for a variety of different uses, inclu including residential. We're also asking that we look at the complexities of VAT uh, in the comparison between new build and refurbishment. So a bit of progress, but not as much as perhaps we need. A um, couple of final thoughts. Um, my members were particularly keen to see that there was continuation of support to reduce youth unemployment. There is quite a, quite a significant increase in education and skills budgets in the agenda, um, but we particularly noted the additional 125 million that was being put aside for youth guarantee uh, into 21-22, which we hope will continue the tack to tackle the challenge of youth unemployment, which is perhaps the most worrying aspect uh, of the labour market's response to date in, in the crisis. Perhaps a little wry smile from those of us in the private sector about the stushy that's developed over public sector pay. I can imagine a number of companies in the private sector where hours cuts and pay cuts and redundancies have dominated their planning. Um, and although I think there are clearly arguments for why certain, uh, some parts of the public sector deserve pay increases, particularly in the health service, um, that Nonetheless, there's a little bit of, uh, as I say, wry smiling going on at the, at the debate that has now ensued from that. And then finally, very finally comment on, um, I have to say, a plethora of budgets that have been set aside to tackle 
uh, climate change, the green re economic recovery agenda, um, needs a lot of review and analysis to understand the extent to which those budgets are actually at the right scale or in the right nature to tackle the issues that they're designed to tackle, but nonetheless, full demonstration of the Scottish Government's commitment to tackling climate change. And I'll stop at that. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, that was uh, a fascinating romp through, uh, it has to be said, uh, what uh, uh, in, in sheer page number terms, uh, a much greater reading than us tax nerds had to do uh, in the course of, of the last 24 hours. There's a lot of pages on uh, very, sometimes very minor things, but for the, the individual and the individual industries affected, um, very important ones. So um, what we're just doing for the last um, 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, uh, what are two questions um, and comment questions to answer, uh, which we'll happily do. Please keep these coming, folks. Please, uh, we'll try and pick them out of the Q&A um, uh, over the next 10 minutes. So don't hesitate to ask any things that you would like to of, of um, the people before you. Um, the first one that we've been asked uh, is uh, relates uh, directly actually to another tax that we haven't mentioned, um, that being aggregates levy. Um, now aggregates levy is a fully devolved tax, but the legislation to bring it into Scotland is not being done. There's a UK aggregates levy which still applies in Scotland, um, but that was, is a fully devolved tax for which the Scottish law is not there yet. And where this links with the question is as follows. What, what, what we're asked is that does our departure from the EU and the terms of the EU-UK trade agreement mean that all the historical state aid restrictions on subsidies, grants and other support for business sectors have fallen away um, and the last words are, or is it more complex? Uh, I think the answer to that is uh, definitely it's more complex, but we'll try and answer a bit of that. The reason I mention it in the context of the aggregates levy is that one of the uh, delays in the aggregates levy actually coming into force as a fully devolved Scottish tax was a state aid issue. There was also some litigation issues going on. Now, both of these have gone or stated in actually in the budget document to have gone, including the state aid one, which is indicative that state aid problems, at least EU-based state aid problems, are no longer as constricting for the Scottish or the UK government if they don't want them to be. But but that, or is it more complex, in my view at least, is still true, um, because there are things that they still have to take into account. Isabel, do you want to say anything about that? I know that you've... you've yes, I think in, in the um, trade agreement, um, which obviously appeared very late in the day, um, just, just before Christmas, the, um, there, are, there is wording which means that the UK government can't just um, do whatever it likes in terms of taxes. Um, but it does have to adhere to, to that sort of framework. So whilst the um, state aid won't continue to work in, in, in the same way, I don't think that, that we can go off into a complete frolic of our own and introduce lots of things which uh, are really favour particular sectors. So unfortunately, it's in the um, uh, a bit more complex than that, but also perhaps uh, not having yet been properly worked out type of box. As, as to where we can go. Stuart, do you have a, a, a comment or view on the, on the state aid situation? Um, I, I, I have to be honest and say I have not managed at this point to read my way through the 1,246 pages of the trade agreement and fully understand exactly what the freedoms are. But I think the basic message was that no, we can't expect to see uh, state aids disappear uh, in their fullest form. I'm sure there are ways there'll be room for manoeuvre around the edges, but uh, mm -hmm. I think we've understood the principle. I'm afraid that state aids are still here, or at least the principles around state aids are still here for us to handle. Um, right, uh, next question we're asked, uh, which I want, I'll just expand on ever so slightly. Uh, what issues arise with current sequencing, sequencing, I'm sorry, of the Holyrood and Westminster budgets? Uh, and do you think something needs done to change that sequencing and why, uh, which is quite a big question in its, in its own right. I mean, the current sequencing, i.e. the two years that we've had of a Scottish budget before a UK budget, I mean, that is not the anticipated and normal sequencing. It was, uh, there was a plan um, at Westminster that the budget, in other words, the tax raising bit of the budget would be an autumn event and the Scottish budget would follow, sometimes depressingly close to Christmas, but in the wake of the UK budget. Now that happened, I think, 
actually in that order only for one year. Um, and then we had things to knock it out of play, general UK general elections, Brexit, and of course the pandemic that must not be named. Um, all of that served to knock it out. What issues does it cause? Well, it was referred to both in the speech and in the, uh, the, the budget documentation by uh, Kate Forbes as really leaving the Scottish government um, not able to do its full job in a budget, either on the spending or the tax raising front, um, because it, it cannot have the full picture because that full picture does not emerge until the UK budget has been presented. And indeed, some of the things that Stuart was saying uh, very much will have to wait because there'll be consequentials of what happens in the UK budget, particularly in some spending things that may have great benefit for some of the things that he was talking about. But on the tax front, then, then there are technical reasons apart from anything else why the Scottish budget does need to be now rather than after the March budget. Notably, notably there is a process at Westminster whereby tax changes can be announced and can become law that day. And the Scottish budget process is no equivalent of that. Um, and th that's one technical reason. There are other perhaps political, perhaps um, uh, in a way constitutional reasons uh, why this has to be in now. Um, does it cause problems? Yes, it does. What should be done about it? Well, without wishing to, to tail and dog, which no doubt Scots are often accused of, I think reverting to the much more sensible system of a, the UK tax raising event, call it the budget or not, taking place in the autumn to be followed in reasonable time by the Scottish budget. Well, we've got tax devolution, we make a lot more sense. Um, Isabel, and then perhaps Neil on that. One other thing that's worth um, bearing in mind is that with the devolved taxes, um, it's not just a question of Scotland raising money from devolved taxes and keeping it all with no impact on the overall block grant from Westminster. And so there's a very complicated process of adjusting the block grant to take into account the taxes raised directly in Scotland and you know the Scottish income tax and so on. Um, that partly plays into this whole um, having the budgets the wrong way around makes everything very difficult because it's hard for the Scottish government to do things until they know what Westminster is going to do. That may all be reviewed as part, there's going to be a review of the fiscal framework, which is the sort of broad arrangements whereby all of this works. And let's hope that that review brings out some more sensible suggestions so that the Scottish Government can use its devolved powers um, without these, these sort of um, difficult um, problems that arise because the Westminster budget is much more movable than uh, the Scottish budget currently is. Neil, do you want to say that particularly, you know, for example, if there was to be major changes in the income tax uh, situation uh, for our UK in the Westminster budget? I, I really kind of feel the, the, the any, th any difficulty that arises there is largely political in that they will, would prefer to have rates uh, lower in Scotland for the lower taxpayers uh, and, and higher for higher taxpayers. So uh, to some extent, that is the difficulty it causes uh, the Scottish government, I would have thought. Um, but that's a political argument rather than a particular difficulty from, 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 a, from a fundraising perspective, I think. So if there was to be, very unlikely this year, a, a major lowering of our UK tax rates when Scottish tax rates had already been announced, that, that's the kind of difficulty that that would, would undoubtedly, and, and I agree, it's a political difficulty that would cause. Yes, exactly. Uh, one would expect that they, there, there might be a revisiting of rates in that situation. Yeah. Stuart, any, uh, it's interesting because, of course, as I've said, the Scottish budget is much more a spending document, at least, but um, that, than the UK budget had become. But I suspect this UK budget will have, will undoubtedly have uh, a large number of spending implications contained within it. Um, any thoughts on, on that ordering your, your, yourself? I mean, you, you adverted to the fact that we'll have to wait quite a few times. Um, do you want to say a little more about that? I, I guess um, inevitably that it's going to be better if we get the order back round to uh, the way it should be um, so that the, the Scottish Government does have more certainty in, in how it's 
uh, deciding on the allocation of its budget to particular spending headings, because that then flows down to how uh, local governments are making their decisions uh, on council tax and on the allocation of funding between their budget headings on what uh, Scottish Funding Council is doing with allocating budgets to its uh, the supported institutions and universities and FE colleges and to all sorts of agencies that are making very last minute decisions about what their budget availability is uh, for the year ahead. But it was noticeable. I, I think that probably does highlight the fact that Kate Forbes made the decision to allocate £180 million uh, pounds towards three months worth of rates relief for the affected businesses without the Chancellor's decision being made demonstrates that she was prepared to go a little bit beyond simply saying I'm waiting for the Chancellor uh, and obviously she also had to make some decisions about what might be available from the Covid uh, reserve funds that are still outstanding for and available for this year so she did make some decisions that went beyond uh, quite a firm statement I'm not doing anything until the Chancellor's had his, uh, had his say, but nonetheless, the principle is right. It, it flows so far down the system that it would so, be so much better to get us back into the into the normal order. Yeah, yeah. yeah I hope that the Kate Forbes one, she doesn't get the cla classic yes minister um, uh, comment. That's a very courageous decision, minister, which is always very worrying for politicians if that's what they're asked in these circumstances. Folks, um, we have slightly, but only slightly, overrun uh, our allotted time. Um, thank you very much for being with us. I'm delighted to say that most of you who joined us at the start have, are still with us now. We are, we are really pleased. Um, one, I think, a couple of other questions that I'll try and answer uh, briefly, at least, in, uh, uh, directly to those involved. Um, sorry that we didn't get to them. Um, thank you very much for attending. Um, in a blatant plug, um, now that the, the, the deadline for getting your tax return, which was going to occupy my Sunday night, of course, in, in a kind of cobbler's bairns way, my own tax return <laughs> tends to be on the 31st of January, uh, but, but others are not. And, and now that there's been this extension, then if you've still got your tax compliance to deal with, then Brodies are just the chaps and chapesses to help you deal with that. Um, so um, please, and of course, we've got now to the end of February to do so, though interest will run, I have to keep getting warned. Um, we'll draw things to a conclusion. Thanks so much for your attendance. Um, we, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we, we may well be back with something similar uh, following the 8th of March, um, taking Stuart's cue that it's uh, at the very least as important, uh, certainly more important for uh, some businesses and other taxpayers. Thanks again, folks, and have a good afternoon and a good weekend. <laughs>